Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Today is May the 19th of, in the year of our Lord, 2022. We have been studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. I'm going to postpone that, uh, our next uh, part in that series, uh, to discuss a subject uh, I believe the Lord's laid on my heart to address. But before I do that, I want to just point out a few things about the next day or two. Uh, as I said, it's uh, as the day of this video being published, it is May the 19th. Now, according to my calculations, and then I base this on the 2550 days that must occur between the rapture and the second coming. If we are here past May 20, and this is the 19th, then you go forward 2550 days and Christ would return when Israel turns 81, 81 years, So then, this 80-year fig tree generation would expire. Now, many of you, you know, might think, well, that's already expired because 1948 to 20, uh, 28, you know, is 80 years. And, of course, a, a, a 2022 rapture would mean that the seven-year tribulation would see Christ return in the year 2029. What I'm doing here is, uh, it's, well, let's just put it this way. The 80 years is, has already expired. Last year, uh, 1948 uh, to 2028, it's already expired. If you're going by Israel becoming 80. And so we're in a, a very, we're in uncharted waters right here. Uh, I hope I'm explaining this correctly here. Yeah, I'm trying to make it as simple to understand as possible. Israel turns 80. It goes through that 80th year. And before it turns 81, well, it's I, what I'm going to, to suggest here is that if we, if God allows Israel to turn 81, then we have to rethink Psalms 90 verse 10. 80 years, you know, with, uh, with strength. You know, the seven-year tribulation being the time of, of trouble and sorrow. Now, many of you understand this. So, we don't want Israel to become 81. And so, we would basically have to be raptured tomorrow or the next day, Friday or Saturday, in order to prevent, quote-unquote, Israel from becoming 81 when the Lord returns 25, 50 days later in the year 2029. If we are raptured tomorrow and you go forward 25, 50 days, Christ would return on Israel's birthday, May the 14th of 2029. On its birthday which means that Israel would complete that 80 years. Now that birthday will, will be 81 for Israel, but it will have, would have completed that 80 years. I hope that makes sense. So I'm gonna suggest that, you know, we're in a, we're in, like I said, we're in uncharted territory. We're in a place where, that we've never seen before that we've never been in before. 
you know, will the fig tree generation prove to be 80 years, or, or was it, will it turn out that it was 100 years or 120 years? It obviously wasn't 70 years. And so that makes May 1920 a very big deal, a pretty big deal. Uh, I haven't seen any videos, anyone put anything out on the fig tree generation expiring. But uh, if you go by May 14, and, you, and that's use that date, May 14, 1948, as a starting point, then that's what we're looking at. Now, creation day one, according to Torah calendar, is, is 9 June. That's when God said, let there be light. 9 June. I consider that a high watch day because the calendar is listing 3979 BC as the year of creation. And so when we count those years to 2022, it's 6,000. And, uh, and so according to Torah calendar, if you started with creation day one, on 9 June 3979 BC, you go forward 6,000 years, the 6,000 years expires June 9 this year. Now, if you want to start that 6,000 year of man's reigning, ruling, God giving Adam dominion for 6,000 years on the day that Adam was created, then he was created on 14 June, June 14. Now, that's strange given the fact that's Trump's birthday, Flag Day, the birth of Judah. Uh, and other things. But that's when the 6,000 years would end. So we're at this uh, tipping point. We're at this point where we're looking at, at least according to Torah calendar, and at least according to the historical record concerning Israel's independence, its new birth, we're looking at uh, an interesting, uh, some interesting variables here that, that concern itself with 80 years and 6,000 years. So I just wanted to point that out uh, before I go any further. So now for the subject of this video. Now, I want to talk about the meaning, the true meaning of John chapter 14. In my father's house are many mansions. Just about every Christian I've ever known is familiar with that passage of Scripture. What do you think Jesus meant when he said, in my father's house are many mansions? In, in your opinion, uh, what is my father's house? I go to prepare a place for you. So define place. Okay, so I'm going to share my view concerning this, and I don't ask it any, as usual, I don't ask anyone to agree with me on anything. In fact, you're probably safer if you don't. But I wrote, I wrote a paper on this back in Bible college years ago, and uh, I think it's uh, one of many passages of Scripture that's been looked at in the wrong light. So we're going to talk about that. Now, I just want to say really right up front here from the outset, I'm not, uh, this is blessed hope forever. Uh, I'm not trying by any means to uh, squash anyone's hopes or their feelings uh, about uh, heaven, uh, about the rapture. Uh, uh, there are many of our brothers and sisters who are not even assured of heaven. And Many look to John chapter 14 as somewhat of a comforting passage that assures them of just that. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. If I come again, I'll receive you unto myself that where you are, where I am, there you may be also, and, and so on and so forth. If you are one who gains a lot of comfort from that passage as far as the assurance of heaven is concerned. I don't want to rob you of that. I do not think that's what it's talking about. 
I'll just say that right up front. We have a thousand or more verses to comfort us uh, concerning the subject of heaven and our assurance of heaven. There are many, many of our brothers and sisters don't even believe in eternal security, but there are an abundance of verses that address the assurance that we have of heaven if we belong to Christ. I just don't think John 14 is one of them. I would encourage you and I would in, really highly recommend that you go back and you, you begin reading at John 14 verse 1. Maybe even begin back in verse at the end of chapter 13, keeping in mind that there were no chapter divisions. Uh, Peter's denial of Jesus and where it crosses over into 14 where the, I don't think that the thought is lost and Jesus is, is certainly concerned about Peter being comforted regardless of his denial. Reading through chapter 14 again crossing the bridge between 14 and 15, going into 15, chapter 15, which talks about abiding in Him. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. Uh, he's the vine, we're the branches. Uh, he produces fruit in and through us. The, the branch doesn't produce the fruit, the, the vine does. And that's the picture that I think we see in chapter 14 as well. It's at least Jesus' concern because He's getting ready to leave His disciples. And I, as much as anyone else would think that Jesus' heart would be toward assuring His disciples of a mansion in heaven or a room in heaven, however you want to translate that word, I do not believe that that was what was on the heart of our Lord as He was getting ready to depart. I'm going to suggest that the place, I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to suggest that that place was the cross. Calvary his death. I suggest that he, Christ himself, he was the Father's house. He was referring to himself. In my Father's house, that is in me, are many abiding places. And this is the word there in, in the original text is the root word means to continue, to remain, to abide, uh, so I'm going to suggest that he is his father's house. The father is living in him. Right away we read that and we just automatically we just jump to, to the idea of heaven and I just don't and you won't see the word heaven ever mentioned in the passage at all. And I understand that I may be slaughtering a, somewhat of a sacred cow here. It seems I, I find myself having to do that from time to time. I'm also aware of the fact that how dangerous it is to go off the beaten path, okay, when so far apart from the common consensus. I understand that as, as well. But folks, I cannot bring myself to believe that John 14 is talking about heaven. And, and more importantly, he's not talking about mansions in heaven, but abiding places in him. The word is minnow in the Greek. That's not the little, not what you put on a fish hook to catch a bass. That's minnow in the Greek abiding places 
in my Father's house that is in me are many abiding places. I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there, there you may be also. See, Steve, he's got to be talking about heaven. No, he doesn't. He doesn't have to be talking about heaven. When did he come again? Well, he came again at Pentecost. And he is presently our abiding place. Paul, one of Paul's favorite phrases was in Christ. It's, we are in him. We abide in him. I suggest he wasn't speaking of, of heaven at all, but they're soon abiding in him, a reality that they needed to understand because he was leaving. Show me one reference to heaven. It isn't there. And context, folks, I've, I've stressed this over and, over and over again, is vital. Chapter 13 ends with Peter's betrayal. He needed comfort. Chapter 14, the cross paved the way for our union with him. And in chapter 15, the context have, is heavily involved in abiding in order that we may bear fruit. Purpose for abiding, fruit bearing. In me there are many abiding places. My death will prepare that place for you. And soon it will be I and you, you and me, just as it was the Father in me and I in, in my Father. The context is works. It's fruit bearing. Abiding in Him. The Father working through Him and Him working through us. Verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. What was on the heart and mind of our Lord? Was it a mansion in heaven, or was it their service and life and their walk in Him in producing fruit? I'm going to contend that it was the latter. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. He did come again and received him unto himself at Pentecost. I'm, I am absolutely convinced in and of myself, you don't have to agree with me, that the idea of heaven has always been based on false assumption and weak exegesis. John 15, 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. And that, that word abide is the word mansion that we see in the King James. Same word. Same word. We are comforted with the assurance of heaven, dearly beloved, in a in a a thousand plus other verses. We don't need to twist John 14 to do that. If we do, I believe we miss seeing a vital doctrinal truth. Our need to abide in Him here and now. Heaven is assumed, but the actual text says otherwise. All the way through. From the end of 13 through chapter 15. 2 Corinthians 5.1 For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Let's look at that verse. We know that if our earthly house, oikia in the Greek, of this tabernacle Skenus, human body, were dissolved. We have a building, oikia, of God, a house, oikia, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That's what we got up there is an oikia. Okay? Not a minnow. The word there is house, building, oikia. The context is heaven. So if John 14, we're speaking of houses in heaven, mansions in heaven, 
places, rooms in heaven, if that's what he was talking about, why didn't Jesus, Jesus just simply use the word oikia instead of meno, to abide, to continue, to remain? John 14, 2, in my Father's house, Oikia, are many mansions, meno. I believe Jesus was saying in Himself, the Father's house, were many abiding places. What church, folks, could you walk into today and hear a message on abiding in Him? Well, not many. I'm sorry to say. He the vine, we the branches. Humans can't produce the divine. We're not under law. We're under grace. We have no righteousness in and of ourselves. We abide in Him. He produces in and through us what we cannot possibly produce in and of ourselves. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I'm the vine. You're the branches. He, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For apart from me, without me, you can do nothing. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live, in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if any righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Is that what you hear? You'll hear a million uh, sermons on, on how you'll get a mansion in, in heaven as long as you work hard to pay for it. Okay? Don't forget that part. All right? But... Christ Jesus is speaking of their lives then, right after his soon departure. In the present, not one hint toward heaven or the life hereafter. I'm sorry, but I cannot help but slaughter this sacred cow. Go back and read through chapter 14, no mention of heaven, not one mention. You won't find the word there at all. You'd think that if, if that was so big on heaven, a chapter that was so big on heaven, you'd think that at least Saranos, the word in the Greek, heaven, would have been mentioned at least once. It's not. It's not there. And then we get over past John 16 into 17, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That's the purpose. Okay? And the glory which thou gavest me, I've given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, thou in me, that they may be made, made complete or perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. John 14, 10, the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. He is the Father's house. John 5, 19, Jesus replied, Truly, truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself unless he sees the Father doing it. For whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Are you getting this? How could, folks, we possibly think that we can or we should work apart from Christ, even when Christ Himself chose not to work apart from the Father. We're gonna, we have the arrogance to assume that we, can, we have the ability to do something that Christ Himself chose not to do. I have a lot more to say about this. But I'm going to skip it for now. We're going to go back to our first to our study in 1 Corinthians. I just want to say, dearly beloved, abide in Him. What does it mean to abide in Him? Well, how do we abide in Him? The word means to continue. 
remain. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Hebrews chapter 4. There's a great deal of struggling and searching and pleading and agonizing in the process of discovering and understanding those above verses, those verses in 14, and our, our walk, our relationship with Him, which is by grace, that we serve in newness of the Spirit, not in oldness of the letter. There, there's a lot of work, labor, in getting to that point. We're told to labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. When, but when we begin to realize something of what is ours in Christ, the, the appropriation of, the, the resting in, that reality must be on the basis of faith, not struggle, not labor. The most laborious thing to do is get to that point where we rest in Him. We rest in the, the finished work of Christ. And once we do, the labor is gone. We rest in order to rest. In quietness, in confidence. Uh, that's, that's our strength according to Isaiah. We're told to quietly and steadily look to our Father in confident trust and thankfully receive that which He's given to us in Christ. So, so you plot on and many a time, faith and courage fail. The mind's weary, the heart's heavy. And you almost give up. And then a miracle seems to happen. The day comes when without your hardly even knowing it, without your hardly even realizing it, what you're seeking has found you. What was once incomprehensible has become such a natural part of your thinking that every bit of that labor is gone. All the frustration, the anxiety, the worry, the fear is gone because you're resting in Him. That is what Jesus, I believe, felt, His heart felt that His disciples needed, as well as us, but His disciples needed at that point because He was leaving them. But He was going to return. He wasn't going to leave them orphans, okay? You get to the point where that, that, that lack of faith is not even felt or recognized anymore. Because it's replaced by an inner certainty, a witness of the Spirit. There's our assurance. Where we come to know that we were always grafted into the vine. We were always His. He loved us. He's, he'd always loved us. He always sought our best. He always wanted His best for us. And we come to that point where the problem of, of abiding becomes as natural as breathing. In fact, I believe that is an exercise of the new man. That's all the new man does. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.